Welcome to MPNUniversity.tv Clinical Insights. This discussion is about biomarkers and targets for therapy in polycythemia vera and is moderated by Dr. Serge Verstovsik. Our panel discussants are Dr. Richard Silver, Dr. Ruben Mesa, and Dr. Susan LeClaire. Hello and welcome to MPN University. Today we gather here to discuss a topic of polycythemia vera. We're going to start discussion about biomarkers of disease activity and uh, targets for therapy in polycythemia vera. Dr. Silver, uh, polycythemia vera is uh, one of the myeloproliferative neoplasms that leads to an uh, increased uh, red blood cell count, sometimes white cells and platelets. We all know from historical perspective that the most important factor appears to be a red blood cell count and hematocrit in particular. Why is that so? Well, we know, first of all, that the red blood cell count is very important in polycythemia vera because that was the original description by Sir William Osler back in the turn of the century. Polycythemia is a disease of too many red blood cells. And when we have too many red blood cells in the circulation, that increases the viscosity, and by that I mean the thickness of the blood. And characteristically, Sir William Osler described the first patient as having stroke. And that's when it came to his attention, and we have now recognized that patients with polycythemia, about 30% of them have stroke as a presenting symptom, and that's due to the thickness of the blood. And why in particular we measure hematocrit and not other markers of the disease activity? Well, the hematocrit is a reflection of a sort of cheap red blood cell count, as I describe it. In the old days, it was very hard and tedious to count red blood cells, and so the hematocrit which is a ratio of the red count to the plasma, is, was used as a substitute. And a sample of blood was taken, it was spun in a very high speed centrifuge, and the ratio of the red cells to the whole blood was measured. And that was given as a percentage of cells in relation to the plasma, and that was a substitute for the red blood cell count. Now, it's very important to recognize that in polycythemia vera, and we discussed this actually, Dr. LeClaire and I, on the way down, that the red blood cell count and hematocrit do not, uh, are not synchronous determinations. And by that, I mean that if the patient becomes iron deficient in polycythemia vera, which they almost all do, even at diagnosis, they're often iron deficient, but certainly when they become phlebotomy, when they are phlebotomized, as the red blood cells become hyperchromic and microcytic, the hematocrit, which is the ratio of the red cells to the plasma, or the whole blood, is not constant. And that's a very important point that people overlook. And it's important because now we don't spin the blood in a centrifuge, we actually count the number of red blood cells. And the hematocrit is a derived value. And by that I mean the hematocrit is a a number that is obtained by multiplying the red blood cell count by the mean corpuscular volume of the cell. And as the mean corpuscular volume of the cell decreases as the patient becomes iron deficient, the hematocrit falls proportionately more than the red blood cell count. So it's a very inaccurate determination when patients are iron deficient. That's very interesting and it's very important. So Dr. Leclerc, should we look as we assess polycythemia vera patients over time, when they become iron deficient, should we look at other measurements? Well, I, I, I have to agree with, with Dr. Silver about the accuracy issue. When the only thing that we had was manual methods for doing red blood cell counts, we were not particularly all that accurate. So the hematocrit was indeed a big step forward. But now with the instruments that we've got, the actual count itself can be done with a great deal more precision and a great deal more accuracy. So now you should start leaning back. It's a change of, of, of thinking to looking at the red cell at, as, as, as a major test. And then perhaps looking at the hemoglobin because you are trying to induce uh, an iron deficiency anemia in, when you phlebotomize these patients. So the amount of hemoglobin that they've got should be directly related to any symptoms that you might see them having shortness of breath, um, uh, pallor, changes in and that sort of stuff. Um, of the indices, and again, he mentioned one of them, the MCV. Yes, it is an average, 
And, and that's a problem because an average is a mathematical number and may have no real meaning. If, if you're going to take an average of the size of oranges, you'll probably get a pretty good answer that will reflect the population of oranges. But I could equally take a population of fruit from raisin to watermelon, I will still get an average, but it has no value, no meaning. Fortunately, we have a test to help you, uh, and that's the RDW. And as you see the RDW increase, it means you're getting this change in size and that you should move away from the hematocrit and more to the red blood cell count and secondarily then to the hemoglobin. So, so Serge, make it if, I, if I may yes. uh, just interject, uh, this hematocrit that you've raised is a very important issue, not just to hematologists, but to internists in, in general. And it's not widely appreciated that it, many factors have determined and affect the hematocrit, a single hematocrit value, such as season. In cold weather, the hematocrit is less than in warm weather. Sudden change in position, the tourniquet that's applied. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the values that can range in a single hematocrit determination, it can be plus or minus 10%. There are studies that we've recently looked into regarding this, and it's amazing how the hematocrit in a single individual can fluctuate from day to day by at least 10%. So if you're fixing on a given hematocrit of, let's say, 48 or 49%, which has been proposed for the New World Health Organization criteria, this can be terribly misleading because of the fact that the single hematocrit is so uh, widely divergent from the standpoint of accuracy. So put, to put it in perspective then, we are talking about a clinical situation where we have a PV patient with uh, iron deficiency where MCV will be low, mm -hmm. the red blood cell count will be high, Correct. and hematocrit will be artificially low because right. the size is Absolutely. so small. Then you should be looking at RDW, the size, mm -hmm. and the hemoglobin mm -hmm. more so than on hematocrit on its own. Now, Ruben, how does this apply in everyday practice? We are all about watching hematocrit. Well, I think it's a, an important component, you know, and, and, and I'm amazed how much I still can learn for, 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 from all of my senior colleagues with such, with such, wow. elegant, <laughs> with, with, with such elegant descriptions of, of these values. You know, but I view it as, one, these are continuous variables, and two, I think there are components that the patient tells us that are considered as well, you know, in that as I try to come up with, with treatment goals for an individual and again listening to the pluses and minuses of what is our metric recognizing that if our target is a certain hematocrit or you know the discussion should that be a slightly different sort of metric you know how a patient is doing in terms of their symptomatology with their blood is a key component as well i find that in pivera you know listening to the patient is really quite important and that there are some individuals that the current thresholds are, uh, are appropriate and seem to be a good fit in terms of reversing the more subtle symptoms they can experience. Difficulties with concentration, difficulties with cognition, uh, propensity toward headaches. You know, patients over time really can be quite attuned to their bodies in terms of uh, how they feel and uh, the need for a phlebotomy. In some individuals, that, that threshold sometimes is a little lower in terms of how they feel. Uh, and in certain studies, trying to have a bit higher thresholds may be helpful in terms of symptoms, but may increase risk of thrombosis. So I think the numbers are helpful, but also seeing how the patient is doing. I have had patients mentioned that their physicians will look at the sheet in lieu of speaking with them and looking at the sheet say, I think you're doing fine, and not listening to the patient who's telling them, you know, I don't really think I'm doing fine today. I, th I think one of the other things that, that uh, Dr. Silva mentioned, temperature, we're all in the winter time, so that's a good one. Uh, I would also like to include in time of day. The, the patient who was first diagnosed um, at 8.30 in the morning, having fasted for, for eight hours, the night before comes in maybe a little bit on the dehydrated side, and you get a certain baseline set of values. But then the next time you see them, it's three o'clock in the afternoon, Maybe it's a different method because your, your office does not have the same instrument that the, the laboratory does, and now all of a sudden you're getting inconsistent results. So at least from the laboratory standpoint, 
um, could you have them all come at the same time? I don't care what time of the day. If they started at 11, have them continue to come at 11. If they started their lab work at 5.30, have them continue to come at 5.30, so that at least we can give you a value that has some consistency to it on the amount of hydration that they've done, the amount of exercise they've done, the amount of worry and, and other activities they've done during the day, all affects that. The, that's a very important point because if they drank alcohol the night before, that will make them dehydrate or even coffee. And, and we've looked at hematocrits early in the morning compared to in the afternoon, you're absolutely right. They're off by about 10%. They're higher. So there are a number of caveats here that I Excuse can me, see. Excuse me, but I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, in, in, in word, please. <laughs> Looks like we have to take it a little bit more serious than just looking at the hematocrit level for our decision making. And this is very good to project to our audience because uh, Every patient is a little bit different. Symptoms are important, not just the numbers. It's a person that we treat. But the guidelines are in the textbooks telling us that we should be looking at those numbers. And hematocrit of 45 or below is the target goal. Is that the goal and should that be the goal? And should there be a difference, and many argue maybe, maybe not, between men and female? Are you asking me? Yes, please. Yes. I, I was just going to say, apropos of the question you asked about uh, should all patients be seen at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? That's a wonderful question because Dr. Uh, Maser is the deputy director of the Cancer Center, and if anyone can do that, he can. I, 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 I much prefer to see them all at 8.30 in the morning, however. I'm more of a morning person. <laughs> but to answer your question about uh, um, the target value of hematocrit of 45, uh, you, you, you should be, one should be aware that that was derived from studies of a, of a fluid, uh, a fluid mechanics professor named Chen, um, C H I E N, in a in a probably a dog model, and the hematocrit value of 45 percent was where the viscosity changed dramatically and increased. So it was thought that this would apply equally to the situation in the human. And in fact, in the Polycythemia vera study group, of which Ruben and uh, his uh, uh, illustrious predecessors at the Mayo Clinic were members, uh, Murray Silverstein and uh, Aya Lutaferi, uh, this was the first uh, cooperative uh, chemotherapy group in the United States, I think it's worth mentioning. That target value was used because of the experimental in vitro data that was uh, found by Professor Chen. And then it was most recently confirmed by uh, an Italian group led by our colleague Dr. Barbui in the Bologna who found that in fact, much to their surprise because we had been saying this for many years, that the target value of 45 percent in men and women, they mixed all patients together, seemed to correlate with a decreased incidence of thrombosis. However, at the point you raise, uh, surge is excellent. The hematocrit in men and women differ, and they differ significantly because the average hematocrit for a man is, say, 45 with a range from 42 to 48, and the average hematocrit for a woman is 36 with a range from 32 to 40. So we have to remember that for a woman, the hematocrit value should be adjusted lower if, uh, if we're going to use that as a target. But as Ruben pointed out, I think that exact value has to, be, uh, has to be targeted in light of the patient's symptoms. And as you know, Dr. Mesa and his group at Mayo have done a wonderful job in really quantifying the symptoms that patients with polycythemia and other monoproliferative diseases have. So we have something to measure that absolute value against what the patient, in fact, reports. And I certainly would agree that we have to always remember that we're treating a patient, not a number. Now, apart from numbers and uh, RDW or MCV, these are all measurements that we easily get through automatic counters and they provide us those, which we should be looking as we discussed beyond just hematocrit. The disease on its own, it's hypercoagulable. It makes people prone to having a clot, not just because of the numbers. Dr. Leclerc, would there be a need for us to expand our, at least at the diagnosis perhaps, to uh, measure something else but the numbers? I think the answer to that is yes, and I have to confess that I think the laboratory has not done or served you well in that regard. Uh, we do not have the capability of testing 
the wide degree of hypercoagulable states that are there. We do fairly well on three of them, um, but I'm not sure that we are capable of, of giving you the kind of information that you need. You ask us about platelets, we give you a platelet number. That number does not reflect whether or not these platelets are hyperactive it, it, or, or non-active, both of which are possible. Um, yes, we have a platelet aggregometry that could give you some of that, um, but again, it doesn't really reflect the in vivo interaction between the red blood cells, all of the clotting factors, perhaps changes in um, vascular inflammation that I'm, I'm going to guess is probably going to happen, particularly in the small vessels, if you suddenly increase the number of red cells by several million per microliter. So we don't actually give you as good um, a formulary of tests that I, than I think we should, and I'm not sure how to, to change that over time. Certainly we have to get the papers out there to do that, but I think it's going to be hard to figure out if it's not protein S and it's not protein C and it's not antithrombin, what else should we be looking for? And I think it's going to be a combination of maybe more sophisticated inflammatory tests and, and, and perhaps additional agonist treatment in platelet aggregometry to help you. This is a really good explanation of what should be in place, but it's not yet. Hopefully we will get there. But you also brought, the, uh, and this is the last question for this panel today, a question of a platelet number. Mm -hmm. It seems uh, that from many studies, we do not really have a correlation between a uh, platelet number and uh, this hypercoagulability state that uh, uh, we right. know all about. Um, and, and that I think actually goes, goes back to an earlier question. Red cell numbers um, are, well, better to, to quantify right now. And we have a much better um, feeling of how red cells work in the capillaries, work in the arteries and the veins. You know what they're going to do. You know they're going to shrink, they're going to expand, but there's only a certain amount of interaction that a red cell is going to do. That's not true with platelets. Um, our testing is much better than it was before, but again, a tourniquet on too long, um, fishing for a, a less than perfect phlebotomy, perhaps um, a slightly longer time in the EDTA. All of those things are going to impact on the activity level of those platelets, making them less representative of what's actually going on in the patient. And that's why I think we need these, this movement to a uh, perhaps more rapid, although I can hear my colleagues in the lab screaming about that right now, uh, but not only a more rapid assessment of platelet function, but a wider range of platelet function. Very nice discussion. I'd like to thank you all for thank your you. participation. Thank you. A pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.